if our nature of reality is truly the one indivisible, um, indescribable um, whole that we are, and that the nature of reality is truly that consciousness that is experiencing itself across these 8 billion dissociative boundaries. And that the, the idea then would be, I'm curious what you think, would it be fair to use an analogy like a dreamed symphony? I've been playing around with this. I'm curious what you think. That we are that, that, that unity, that unity of a symphony, and that each one of us in the symphony is playing a different instrument. I'm playing the cello, you're playing the clarinet, someone else is playing the sax, someone else the drums. And that we're even people that are playing the same instrument are playing different melodies or harmonies. And that actually your son, right? Co Cosmo's a musician, right? Mm. Yes, yeah. yeah, okay. And so the, the, the idea is that if I'm, if, and, and by the way, the conductor is like a, an, a, is an attractor. So there's like a, you know, the, the mathematical system is we're comp the, there's a mathematical attraction for our complex system to evolve towards this uh, attractor, which, which could be like a Ouroboros or something like a, you know, an automata orthogenesis to a recursive function or something. But the point is, is that like, is the dream symphony analogy a good way for us to understand, like if I'm playing more out of tune, let's say my cello, I'm playing more out of tune, that's because I'm serving to myself. But if you're playing your clarinet and you're playing it in tune, that's because you're playing service to other. And so the other. So the idea is that we are going through some sort of a, a dreamed symphonic, uh, artistic oneness evolution and that we can both integrate into the symphony and differentiate like in calculus of our unique contribution. How do you, how does that dream symphony analogy for the nature of reality resonate? Well, it does rather assume that everything is working together to start with. I mean, uh -huh. the symphony orchestra, uh -huh. Uh -huh. they have to have a shared agenda to play, uh, to have a symphony together. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's, it's not um, immediately obvious that there is, at least as far as the whole of humanity is concerned, a, a shared symphony. I mean, the President of the United States and, you know, the, the various figures in Islamic fundamentalist movements, etc. Um, I mean, the, 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 there's so many different points of view, the, you know, Hindu nationalists in India, you, you know, Chinese asserting their power, etc. It's not clear that everyone sees themselves as part of a coordinated symphony of humanity. Um, and uh, for the dream symphony to, uh, I think people would have to sign up to be part of a dream symphony orchestra um, uh, for this particular metaphor to work. Uh, it's not obvious that's the case. Um, you could argue that there are underlying creative forces that, I mean, I myself think there are, um, working through history and that conflict is part of it. And that, that conflict plays its part in the creative uh, evolution of things. I mean, a personal example, uh, when my book, uh, Science Set Free came out, my TED talk, my TEDx talk in 2013, the called the science delusion uh, was taken down by ten from their main website because of protests from militant materialists P. Z. Myers and Jerry Coyne, who are both militant Richard Dawkins type materialists, um, and Ted uh, tried to uh, suppress this talk or at least hide it uh, completely unsuccessfully. And but this attack uh, from these people who wanted to stop me having a platform. Uh, led to an enormous controversy on the internet. The result is that at least six million people have seen this talk now, whereas before their protests, only about 30,000 had seen it. So um, they were playing their part. And, you know, I don't have a kind of personal hostility to people like Jerry Coyne and stuff. I mean, they're playing their part in this drama. 
But dream symphonies also include dissonances. I mean, music's not all harmony. And, you know, mm. the, the diss dissonances are part of it. Mm. So it may be that, that Jerry Coyne is part of this dream symphony without realizing it. Um, so I, okay. I think... Okay, so, so it could also be fair to say that not only is it that we may have different national agendas ac ac across the planet uh, in parts of the symphony, but also just that in general, um, within the symphony, the playing out of tune is not only when you're trying to like hoard things in service to self mentality, but it's also when you are um, being militant in one specific dogma. And yeah, I, I think that's very interesting. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. Okay. And of course, people may also play out of tune out of sheer incompetence. So, um... <laughs> mm. uh, Rupert, um, I want to ask you on a on a um, on a telos perspective. Um, given the fact that artificial intelligence is now significantly for deeper emergence, so are virtual realities, which are kind of, in a sense, when you when you immerse yourself in one for an extended period of time, you in a sense could say that, holy cow, how am I not already in one? How is this not already one? So we have AI, we have VR, we have simulation technology, simulation theory. Could it be that we're, these technologies are, are triangulating on the same thing in the sense that the Eastern spirituality has been saying for the longest time that the dreamer, the ultimate dreamer of infinite consciousness ends up uh, in this dream that we're in now, wakes up and then goes right back into another dream as in the Ouroboros continues. So is the West, what is the telos? Is the West focus on AI, VR, simulation tech? Could that be what John Smart calls the transcension hypothesis when we go inward into these substrates and that we uh, continue the Ouroboros and that we keep going through more and more big bangs and that that is our, in, that is our, uh, that, that's our attractor? Is that the telos? How, what do you think about that? Well, I think that there's there's a sense in which artificial intelligence, virtual reality, you know, are expanding the realm, uh, certainly of what machines can do, and also of things like games and whatnot. Um, I think there's a parallel exploration going on, uh, which is non-technological through this uh, the um, renewed research on psychedelics, because yes. psychedelics, after all, are a way of opening up the imaginal world. Um, particularly the visionary ones. I mean, ayahuasca, um, LSD, mushrooms, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, which have uh, an enormously liberating effect on the imagination for many people. Um, I mean, they're not for everyone, and I'm not advocating indiscriminate use of psychedelics, and especially not uh, encouraging people to do anything illegal. I mean, I have to say these disclaimers. Um, but the fact is that um, there's, uh, as well as this exploration. Um, we've also got a parallel exploration going on. And in fact, in places like Silicon Valley, the exploration through psychedelics um, is often happening in the same people who are engaged in, in the, especially in uh, computer graphics mm -hmm. um, and visualizing things and virtual reality. So I think here we've got uh, this uh, expanded range of explorations that aren't based on technology. I mean, personally, I think they're more fun when they're not based on technology. I mean, I'm not very technological myself. Um, but I think this exploration of consciousness, um, which after all has happened in the East through meditative techniques, it's happened in the West through meditative techniques. I mean, contemplative Christianity in the Middle Ages and, and since then in the Catholic and the Orthodox tradition, monks and nuns, living in enclosed orders. Some of them spend hours a day in meditation and prayer, and they're exploring realms of consciousness. And they're not just exploring their own consciousness. The whole point is that through meditation and these spiritual practices, you come into contact with other forms of consciousness. That's the whole point of my recent books, and the most recent one being <laughs> Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work.
seven different spiritual practices um, uh, which have been scientifically investigated and are about exploring these realms of consciousness beyond our normal everyday consciousness. So I think what's exciting at the moment is there's a, a new phase of spiritual evolution beginning through the widespread availability of spiritual practices and scientific studies of them, and also all these amazing technological uh, adventures. And I think that they're, they're complementary. I don't think it's one or the other. Yeah, there's a big convergence that is happening there. And whatever the telos uh, ends up being, wherever the attractor of the complex system is heading, it's inevitably, it, it, uh, in order to be happy and have great well-being and have good amounts of peace and collective prosperity and individual flourishing, one needs to embody what you write about in Ways to Go Beyond, where you, where you talk about specifically um, also the practices of doing things like meditation. Um, I think people also forgot that even the word yoga means union in Sanskrit. It's not holding stretching positions and it means union with the divine, whatever your unique combinatoric is with the divine. Um, and also gratitude is such a, a prominent one that is so important. And it's the way that science and spirituality are converging, which you've written about so much, um, going out in nature, 